Mini episode 152 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini-episode number 152. This is FDH Management Partner Rick Morris here, along with another one of our original FDH Lounge dignitaries, Nate Noy. Uh, we got a great one for you here today. We, we have started recently on this program to sort of delve into some of these areas of uh, TV shows that are uh, of great critical acclaim that people really love carrying through and dissecting. We started to get into this a couple of years ago, and uh, we, we didn't end up following through on it at the time. The great thing about being a show where nothing is off topic is you can always come back to it. The night of the last Sopranos episode, early in the run of the program, we had on one of our dignitaries, Bob Glassman, to break it down for us. But me not having HBO, I wasn't really watching. It was more so interviewing him, getting his thoughts on it. And Bob had great thoughts on it, but it's always better when two people can kind of tear into something from both of them having knowledge on it and go back and forth. And That's what Kyle and I did when we were breaking down season four. I'm sorry, uh, that was uh, season five of Mad Men. And we're going to be doing the same thing today, uh, looking back a little bit at Season 4 of Breaking Bad and ahead to Season 5, which begins uh, this weekend on AMC. Uh, it's actually debuting at uh, Comic-Con with the, uh, the the first episode of the, uh, the year and uh, debuting, as per usual, 10 p.m. Sunday night in the time slot, 10 p.m. Eastern Time on AMC. As I indicated, myself, Rick Morris, and, and another one of our originals here today, Nate Noy, breaking it down with us. Nate just uh, inhaled the episodes recently on uh, on DVD, and uh, that's going to be part of our conversation also about the best way to watch a show like this. I watched it in real time last summer. I inhaled it on DVD recently just to kind of get it all fresh in my mind again, and Nate watched it for the first time over the last couple of days on DVD. So we'll uh, start the conversation there, I suppose. Good buddy, Nate Noy, in with us here today. Nate, how you doing, my friend? Doing great, Rick, and so happy about a year ago you forced me to watch Breaking Bad. Actually, it's, you forced me to watch one episode probably two years ago, and then I just, uh, we talked about it, I kind of stumbled on it, Netflix, started watching season one, and watched all three seasons over the course of like two days. I just couldn't get enough Breaking Bad when I first got turned on to it, and, uh, and then waited a long time for the folks at Netflix to put season four up, and you came to the rescue because they never did. <laughs> uh, well, and I had to, you know, do the do the DVD thing, as you said, uh, over the last two days. So, you and I sort of did the manual Netflix thing here. After I after I watched it on DVD, I shipped them down to you, and we did it that way. Let's let's go back to the very beginning. So, like I said, you, you talked about that. That I, I showed you a couple of clips uh, when when you were up here at my place uh, previously, and. I don't remember how much we watched exactly, but once you started watching uh, season one, episode one, how far, how long did it take before you were like, okay, I got to keep going on this. This is really, I got to see where this leads me. Yeah, I, I I didn't turn it off. I mean, I was getting screamed at to take out the trash because I wouldn't leave the TV for like two straight days. I couldn't get enough. <laughs> I mean, it, it's and you got to realize with me. I mean, I am a TV snob. I very rarely will watch a new show. I don't like new shows. I tend to think that the best TV was when I was growing up in the 80s. So it really, you got to twist my arm to get me to even check out a new show. And this was the least disappointed I ever was in terms of a new show. I mean, this show is far and away one of the top five shows in the history of TV in terms of writing, in terms of acting, in terms of can they surprise you. And I think that's the key, Rick, is... That's why I don't watch a lot of TV or even movies. I'm one of those people that I always anticipate what's coming next, and it bores me to death when I'm always right about what's coming next. And this show doesn't let you do that. No matter how, you know, how much of an analytical mind you may have, you will never see it coming. At least, you know, I, six to eight times in this last season, it just came out of nowhere what they did with the show, 
and there are very few shows on TV or very few movies that do that to people where you just – and it's not like they throw something at you that doesn't make any sense. You don't see it coming, and it fits right into the story, and that is so rare in today's in today's TV and, and movie realm. It's tremendous the way that Vince Gilligan and his, his uh, critical team have been able to uh, make this uh, happen. Uh, the creative folks that, that bring this thing together and, and breathe the life into it. I have to say, uh, on a larger note, uh, another one of our fellow original FDH Lounge dignitaries, uh, Jason Jones, he's kind of uh, commented to me over a period of time, without, without outright calling me a hipster, uh, talking about how I tend to like a, a lot of these critically acclaimed shows that are on cable now, be it this one, be it Justified, be it... Uh, Mad Men or, or some of the other ones out there. I, I would say, too, that in a larger sense, uh, I do kind of believe that this is a, a golden age of, of TV and that uh, you're talking about the 1980s and the stuff that was around with The Wire, which I haven't seen yet, The Shield, which I haven't seen yet. There are a fair number of them that really approach this in a more cinematic kind of a sense. And I think that's what you're talking about here when you're talking about not seeing these twists and turns coming. I mean, isn't that the, the biggest difference here, that these are shows that are being written like a movie? Granted, it's a movie that plays out over a couple of different seasons, but the unpredictability, the twists and the turns, and making them line up in a way that actually makes sense uh, on paper and otherwise. It is exactly like a movie, and the only thing I can even think of that's close to this in the last decade was 24. 24 did a good job with that as well, where you thought you were watching a movie, and that's the thing with, with Breaking Bad. It's like watching a movie. Every single episode is just a long, extended movie, way better than regular television, not even close. I would agree with that, uh, certainly. You know, as, as we're looking at this, as we're looking at how everything played out, everything in Season 4, setting up for Season 5, my kind of premise, particularly as I'm looking ahead, as I'm reading some of the uh, the interviews that have been done recently, I've, I've tried not to get too spoiled on Season 5, but I think uh, Brian Cranston, Vince Gilligan, Aaron Paul, et cetera, have done a pretty good job of letting you know some of the things that are coming without uh, spoiling you too much. But the way I look at it, let's start from there. I kind of view the whole Gus thing as the second act of, of a three-act series over the course of uh, this run of the show, which is going to be going uh, six seasons now, eight episodes this year, eight episodes uh, next year. You had everything, I think, leading up to Gus in the beginning when you had Walt and Jesse just kind of fumbling, trying to do it themselves, trying to build their network. Then they get integrated into Gus's network. Is this how you kind of see it, that as season five starts, wherever this is going now is basically the start of the third act? I agree with that. I think you definitely could say that, you know, this was the first segment of the show. They were on their own. Then they had this whole Gus interaction, which is like, you know, almost two seasons. And now you've got this third step, which is, you know, I'm not sure what it's going to be. Is it going to be more of, you know, Hank's recovery and, and his search for, uh, for what he, what, what, something's got to happen to get things back on Hank's radar, I guess is one of the things I'm thinking about for this season. And maybe that's all part of this third act, you know, because if at this point, you know, with, with Gus, being killed and the cartel guy being the one that did it and, and, and Hank being on the trail of that. I think everybody in the in the police community, at least the way it's you know set up, is they could see closure at this point. So what's got to happen to get that back on the radar? That, that's my big question leading into this, and maybe that is the whole you know kind of theme of this third act, as you call it. Well, I will say this, and again, and without wanting to spoil anybody, but something I was just reading this morning is that uh, – it does seem to be playing out as it did last year, of, of where Hank was sort of pushing ahead more so on his own instincts. The one thing, and I, and I don't think this is a spoiler to say this to anybody, Hank knows, and I think everybody knows, Gus was not Heisenberg. Okay, Gus might have been a mastermind behind this thing, the guy helping making it happen, whatever, but the master meth chef that was out there, and assuming it's not Gale, which they seem to have come to the conclusion that it's not, so Hank is still going to be sniffing around for Heisenberg. I don't think that's a spoiler to, to say that because, uh, again, there's no evidence whatsoever that uh, that Heisenberg uh, was uh, wiped off the mat. Granted, the super lab was, was burned to the ground there, and it, it'll be very interesting to see where that goes. And the role of and, and, and I, I, I this is another thing that's not a spoiler either, the fact that Mike the Cleaner reemerges and, as I understand it, plays a heavy role in the first two episodes. You had to know something was coming there because, Nate, that was one of my first thoughts at the end of last season is, you know, when you're thinking about you know, Gus's restaurant and everything like that and all the records that are out there, I'm thinking to myself, there's, there's no question that Mike the Cleaner is going to have his hands full at this point uh, erasing the trail as much as he can. 
Yeah, I agree with that. You know, they kind of just, uh, what was like three episodes ago, Mike the Cleaner was left in Mexico and never came back into the scene. So you knew, you knew they were saving him for something. They're just not going to write that character off. It's way too strong of a character. And as you and I have talked about out there, maybe one of the scariest characters in all television history. Oh, I'll tell you what. When we were still doing the show, um, in conjunction with that, a sports talk network and a fellow named uh, Walt Payton, friend of ours, was uh, producing the show at the time. I remember saying to him, because Walt watched the show also, I said, how much would you crap your pants if you ever had Mike the Cleaner show up on your doorstep? Uh, I, I saw an interview where uh, Jonathan Banks, the actor that was playing him, was saying, you know, what a godsend it is. I mean, where's an actor in his late 50s, early 60s going to get a role that's as cool as that one? And everything that that's, uh, that's done for him and his recognition, and it, it is an iconic character, no question about it. The show has a number of them, uh, whether it be him, whether it be Saul Goodman, all these other folks uh, that are in there, but as, as far as it goes on a character basis, it all comes back to Walt White, and this is something you and I talked about off air, is that the the uh, complete uh, disintegration of this man's soul over the first four seasons, and it really took you up until the last moment, as you commented to me, and I've seen this opinion other places, that uh, the last episode of season four could have served somewhat as a season fin- or as a series finale, as, as far as wrapping uh, things up and you know, with his victory over Gus in the end. But what it came down to in the end was how far he had to stoop to be able to beat Gus. And that seems to be the key to the entire situation. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, the, the, I guess the, the story of the whole show is the transformation of Walt. And, and you look at, you know, where he was in season one to even where he was in the box cutter episode of season four, where the look of fear that they put on his face, you know, when, when, when Gus sliced his uh, henchman's throat and, you know, how just, I don't even know what to call it. He, you know, he was like a scared little weakling at that point. And in no way could he ever kill, you know, then, then mid season that he, he did the whole thing where he was walking to shoot him and he was nervous about it. And he got the phone call and turned around and, and took off. And, you know, the crawl space, even right up to the end, he was still scared. You know, Jesse beat him up and, 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 uh, uh, it was just unbelievable how, how weak of a character he was in terms of his confidence and, and what he could do. And then they, like, flipped the switch, and at the end, he was true psychopath. I mean, no fear, nothing. He, you know, willing to sacrifice an, an elderly neighbor, willing to sacrifice a child, willing to sacrifice anything at that point. And, uh, you know, the whole comment at the end of season four, I won. Uh, you know, that, that kind of, just the way they wrote, wrote that and the way he said it, it's, it's, that gives you the message. Transformation complete. Now it is truly a new show because we've got Psychopath Walt. I don't think they're ever going to put him back on the old Walt. We're going to see where this goes now with him being out there as just a guy that you'd be scared of. Now, he wasn't somebody I'd be scared of in real life uh, up to two, two episodes to go, but I certainly want to cross, wouldn't want to cross paths with that guy at this point in real life, you know, given what they did to the character. No, I don't think so either. And, uh, you know, Vince Gilligan, uh, the creator of the show, has been saying from early on, uh, that it's the transformation of, of Mr. Chips to Scarface, and you look at it, and yeah, it, it, it took until very late in the game, really the end of season four for it to get to that point, but all indications from what I've been reading for season five and season six is, yeah, this is where it goes at this point, full step ahead, or full speed ahead, stepping on the throttle as far as uh, th- that character, where it's going, and and, and again, you know, how he's become this kind of a man, and, and where, uh, again, he's going to be, you know, more and more openly kind of a, a drug ward. And that was one of the very interesting things about uh, Season 4 is that he and Skyler worked to construct this, uh, you know, kind of flimsy facade of, you know, uh, this gambling addict savant kind of a thing. And he made a bunch of money, but he's not, you know, it, it consumed him and everything like that. Just because Hank's his brother-in-law and he can't let the DEA know what he's up to, but from from the early days of the show when he was living more of a double life as a teacher by day, now at this point with his uh, you know leave of absence or whatever you want to call it from teaching, uh, again, his, his life and, and the whole Heisenberg thing is getting to be more and more and more out in the open, and I think that's where that vicious streak is going to continue to manifest itself. I agree. I think we'll see a lot more exposure. Now, I will say this as well. When I first started watching the series, I'm somebody that watched, I, I don't know if I missed any episodes, at least not after having Netflix. I, I think I've seen every single episode of Malcolm in the Middle. It took a long time for me to get out of my head that this isn't how. 
You know, it's like, it's it just because you watch him so many times, you know, hundreds of episodes of him being Hal. And, uh, you know, one, at the end of season four, I didn't even think about him as Hal. It ain't even close. And two, just the, the, the range of acting skills it takes for Cranston to be able to act as a Hal, to fall, you know, to what he's become in this show from, you know, where he started to where he's at, it's amazing. I mean, I know he's won some, some Emmys, I guess, and maybe they're not eligible because it's such a short season and wasn't releasing it, but it, it's, again, one of the most uh, marvelous acting jobs in the history of television as well as what he's done with this character. It, it has been unbelievable, and it's one of those things. I'm fascinated by what you said there because this is one of the things when we've talked about folks, uh, when we've talked on the show previously, say, with uh, Ben Lyons, uh, the, the movie critic, when we've talked about characterizations, I'm always fascinated by this, that as far as what you think of, of uh, an actor based on what they've played uh, previously. We, we've talked about this with Ben Lyons as far as uh, some of the post-Seinfeld projects and, and how I, I said to him, I said, I might be the only person out there, but I really liked when Michael Richards had his show and when, and when, and when Jason Alexander had his show because there were elements of those characters in there, real or imagined, where it allowed me to kind of, in some way, view it as an extension of Seinfeld. It wasn't the same thing, but I'm wondering to whatever extent psychologically here, and, and this is just going to be your opinion and my opinion, but those early episodes, were they trying in some way to make you think of that other sitcom father? Was it a thing where we're starting him in a similar place where this guy is just kind of a somewhat kind of put upon suburban dad who's dealing with family issues and everything like that and, and taking it in that way, do you, do you think, and, and, and to whatever extent, that the casting of Brian Cranston may have been deliberate in trying to put that into our heads at the outset? I absolutely believe that. I mean, it was a great hook for people that were fans of Up in the Middle that liked Cranston's character there. You know, he, it would be too much of a shock to flip him to where he's at now at the beginning with people just tuning into the show. That That gradual change you hook them, you get them in, they watch the show because it's how, uh, and they watch you transform over time, they're going to watch every episode of the show till it's off the air. You know, you don't flip the switch. I agree. I think maybe that was part of the, you know, the casting uh, idea was that you get a guy that fits this, you know, suburban dad family guy role very well, who's well recognized for that role, and then transform him, and then really, you know, talk about a master plan and a way to, to really make a show stick for a long time is... You know, you take a guy that's that well embraced, you get everybody into watching, and then you transform him. Uh, the, the amazing job that you do acting-wise and writing-wise to make that happen and make it believable. Uh, you know, these guys, at the end of the day, are going to be able to walk away from this series knowing it was one of the greatest things to ever happen on TV. They really are, and it's fascinating, too, that once you once you get further into this, you can kind of look back at some of the guideposts along the way, and because the central story of Breaking Bad is... Uh, the transformation of this man pretty much losing his soul completely. You go back to the the one precedent uh, for cold-blooded violence from him, I, I would say, would be uh, 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 season three, late in the game there. I think it was the, uh, the Half Measures episode when he ran down the drug dealers who were about to shoot Jesse. That could be viewed uh, in, in some ways as not exactly self-defense, but defense of his partner. Same way as when he killed Tuco earlier in the, in the series, that basically was self-defense. He didn't grieve over those things there. He did somewhat sort of uh, grieve over uh, collateral damage at, at other points along the way and show remorse. And uh, his reaction early in Season 4 to what happened with Gail uh, there when, when, he, when he saw the videos over at Hank's place and he was sort of forced to confront that uh, because Gail at that point was the closest thing to any innocent uh uh, collateral damage that had happened along the way, but it's a thing now where he's gotten to be so immersed in his own justifications for everything that he's done, you look at it now, and this character doesn't feel capable of showing, I think, that kind of remorse for Gale. No, not at all. Um, and as you pointed out, though, I guess, you know, maybe in the end, and maybe the end game is that he actually decides to go after Hank, because you know, he made the big choices in this season to protect Hank, and risk himself, his own his own risk and his own peril, and as well as his family's. You know, maybe that's the last thing that has to happen for him to be a true psychopath. Is to actually, you know, to go after the brother brother in law in some way, shape, or form to to no longer protect him, but to care more about himself and what he's got going than to care about his brother in law and his family. That's true, because as you and I were talking about off air, the real psychotic turn late in the game with the last two episodes that he took, it was prefaced by. 
him uh, getting the tip into the uh, the DEA about Hank's wife being in danger. And that was the one thing where Gus said, if you do that, your family's going to get wiped out. He went ahead and did it uh, anyway. So that was the one thing that did sort of go against the selfish psychopath kind of character that he developed, although everything he did from that point on, I think, strongly reinforced that every end justified every uh, means, you know, in his book as far as how it was going but there there were just so many things that were that were that were piling up at the end of the season it's very interesting i i'm wondering what you think are going to be some of the more significant loose ends uh yet to come here i i counted up a couple of different ones uh you know that you you've got the uh, the super lab that got burned down i'm wondering to whatever extent uh, forensics is is going to be able to get anything out of that you've got ted's apparent death there with the irs situation is that going to come back into play um, it, uh, are the, uh, the DEA, are they going to know immediately right off the bat that Hank is out of danger, at least for right now, or, or are they going to be able to do it that successfully? Um, as far as everything they had from Gail, is there anything of, of Gail's materials that's going to be able to tie in now that they know about Gus, now that they know about the super lab? So there's any number of different things here, too. Uh, we'd already alluded previously to Mike uh, going back in. I'm sure he's going to be spending a good part of the first two episodes trying to cover the trail from his end. So what are some of the bigger things you're guessing looking ahead to season five in terms of these loose ends as far as being significant? You know, and that's the thing, Rick, about this show. I can sit here and think about all kinds of stuff and speculate, and I've got a couple in mind, but the writers do such a great job of throwing stuff at you you never saw coming. You know, I'm guessing, first of all, there's six to eight things that will happen that we never even thought in the possibility, of the realm of possibility of what would happen. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe there's a you – know, we, we think the cartel's wiped out, but – you know, if there's all this money being made in New Mexico, there's got to be more than just one cartel ready to come back in, right? So maybe we'll see right. another emergence of some kind of cartel. Uh, you know, the, the you know Jesse, what, what happens with him? What happens with, you know, his transformation? I mean, he's, he's kind of the subplot, sub-character. You know, where he was at the beginning of Season 4 is, a, you know, a drug addict that's just got, you know, throwing money around and drugging out and have all these people bumming off him to being a family guy at the end. I mean, that's a serious transformation. Will he stay on that path or, or will, you know, we, we, it's unresolved with, you know, his girlfriend thinking maybe he had something to do with the kid getting sick. Maybe that'll blow up. Maybe they'll take that, t- turn Jesse back into something that he isn't at this point in the series. So, you know, where do they send him? Uh, you know, like you said, what, what happens with, uh, the death of, of, of the boss of the, of the broken neck there, we, we, you know, Sal, Sal uh, Saul's, uh, henchmen or whatever they are. I mean, is there anything coming to that? Is Hank going to rehab? You know, that's kind of one of those things of, well, normally you would expect that, but maybe they'll have something else happen to Hank. There's so many things they can do with this show, and they've got, got you guessing at so many different points that you do have these unresolved questions, but even if they don't answer them, they're going to take it in another direction where you don't even think about what your question was. When the, you know, right now in between seasons, I'm sure – Eight weeks from now, you know, we review that what happened in this short season. Uh, we'll have a whole new set of questions that, you know, they're going to hit some of these things we thought of, and they're going to come up with new things for us to think about for the next time around. So, well, and, and they're very good at callbacks, also uh, that they will go back to things that, that that happened previously and find a way to make it make sense. I know this won't surprise you very much to know this uh, in, in terms of uh, along those lines and some things I'd read for season five. That uh, Madrigal Corporation, I think, was their name. The folks that were shipping the materials for the super lab, that multinational corporation that was somehow connected to Gus, they're going to be in play this season, and there's going to be uh, at least uh, one or two characters introduced on that end. And I don't know, again, I'm only speculating. It doesn't seem like Mike knew about too many of the intricacies of that business on, on, on that level but perhaps Mike is somehow the conduit as far as you know, getting them back into play. But when you go to tie something like that back in, that I guarantee you at the end of season four, none of us were sitting here thinking about them even for a second. It's a way to bring it back in that's organic because you planted a seed earlier, but it's, it's something that, again, makes sense. And like you said, it's a twist that we won't have seen coming. That's the beauty of this show. Like, I was just thinking about the bomb, and you and I talked about the bomb and how did he make the bombs. And if you think back to, to episode one of this season, uh, you, you saw a bomb on Gail's desk or table, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're always planting seeds in this show. And, and, and it's a show that you could – I mean, I'm thinking about right now going back and starting on season one again 
and watching it again because they do that. They plant a seed. It might be five, six episodes later where that seed, you know, blossoms, and it's amazing. You know, they, they don't – they rarely just throw something completely out of the blue. There's always something that's backdrop slightly, subtly, somewhere at previous episodes, and uh, and then you get to see it, you know, and you thought, oh, wow, there it is, you know, the whole – what they did with Gus this season and explain why Gus is why he is, that was great. And, uh, you know, they, they, had, they just do a masterful job of, uh, you know, giving you just a little bit of information. I agree. I mean, we had this whole mystery corporation thing and the, the, the order that was never paid for and all that stuff. When, when they throw stuff like that out there, you got to definitely pay attention. And it's not the first time you watch it, the second, because you're probably going to hear about that again. At least there's a chance you will. So. And I think that ties back to what we were talking about before as far as the cinematic method. When you're watching a movie, when you're watching a thriller, there will be seeds planted that are going to come back into play. And I think that's what you end up seeing in the course of something like this. So ultimately, as it's going along, when you're looking at the things late uh, in in the game here, when you're looking at what is going to be uh, going on, as this thing uh, progresses, you have s- secrets on two levels now that are very significant. You have Walt living the double life, keeping it from Hank and, and from uh, you know the authorities, but also now Walt and Jesse, because Walt previously let Jesse's girlfriend Jane die. Uh, it, it, it seems to be something about Jesse's intimate relations that he has. Now his girlfriend, he's let her son be poisoned, basically was the cause of it. So there are secrets between Walt and Jesse that are, are very, uh, very much uh, crucial uh, going forward on this thing here. And there's been speculation that in the end, this Walt-Jesse partnership, uh, when, when this thing comes to a head at the end of Season 6, that it will be Jesse who's the one knocking on Walt's door and this time pulling the trigger. So there, there's all kinds of things that are going to make you wonder over the course of the next 16 episodes over two years, which of these secrets are going to blow up and when. I agree with that. And, and you know, you think about, I mentioned this to you off there as well. This season, up until the point where Jesse beat Walt up, every interaction, every interaction between Walt and Jesse was Walt completely manipulating Jesse to do what he wanted or to have the idea that he wanted. Or it just kept constantly, you know, especially knowing everything else you know about what's going on in the show, watching those interactions and being like, wow, here he is totally manipulating him, completely trying to control him. You know, and even after he got beat up and he came back together there at the end, he still was doing that. He still was manipulating him. Will it become a point when, you know, Jesse catches on? Because Jesse is a sharp character, really, uh, where, where that's no longer possible for Walt. And if that dynamic's out of the mix, how do those two play out together? And as you said, maybe the end game is that Jesse's the one knocking on Walt's door. We'll see. He may very well be. And it's very interesting as far as the whole thing about knocking on the door because uh, that was another one of the things that I had read uh, as far as uh, – uh, critics uh, previewing season five and taking a look ahead here. That what Walt said earlier in the season, and, th- and this is this is amazing because it ties back to what you said before about really what a wuss Walt was in a lot of ways at, at the beginning of, of season four. Yeah, you know he he killed people previously when his back was against the wall, but that seemed to be like a momentary summoning of whatever powers he needed, as opposed to being a truly vile enough person to do it on a regular basis. But when he said to Skyler, I, I'm the one who knocks on people's doors, like, yeah, right, okay, Walt, yeah, go back to cowering in your bedroom there. And by the end of the season, he was that guy, and he will be that guy the rest of the way through with the series, uh, you know, as it's continuing to manifest itself. So we can look forward to that with Walt continuing to be that guy who, who knocks on the doors. And, again, how does that tie in at some point to Hank? Because, again, as you pointed out previously, when Hank was enough of a danger to Gus, Gus was like, okay, all right, time to take him out. And will Walt cross that line himself? This is about crossing every moral and ethical line, and Walt's crossed most of them. Tie back into family in the end as as far as crossing those lines. Absolutely. That's a great backdrop to what we may see to come. But uh, two more things I wanted to say about this show. Uh, cause I know we're running out of time here. The, uh, first of all, if somebody out there has listened to this and hasn't watched it, you really owe it to yourself to go back and watch season one first because you can start watching the show in the middle of a season or out of nowhere. It's still a good show, 
but you really need the whole picture. You need to watch it all. You need to start with season one, episode one. You'll get so much more out of it if you start at the beginning than you will if you just try to jump in. Because there's, it's a show, like I said, it can be watched from the middle, but it's well, way better if you start with it. Do you agree with that? I certainly agree. Uh, now, I started watching it uh, season three, episode one, and then I was watching one and two on DVD in parallel. Uh, but, yeah, I would I would recommend the other way more so. Speaking of methodology, and that's what I want to circle back around to in the end is the DVD versus live question. But I know you had another point there as well. No, that was what I wanted to bring up, so go ahead. Oh, okay. All right, well, we talked about this. We teased it a little bit at the outset here, this whole thing. And I, and I was looking up specifically. I, I read so many different things, and, and that's the whole thing here. I think that's the point of doing a show like this. I know there's a lot of people out there like us that consume this the way that they do. For the shows that I really love, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Justified, I mean, I may read 10 to 15 reviews a week, and that includes the comments, that includes, uh, you know, different message boards and everything like that. You want to see what other people are picking up, and i got to tell you, I mean, probably at least 50% of what I know about these shows are, I mean, 50% might be a little high, but there's there's a lot of things I picked up that I didn't catch that other people caught or interpretations or, or things like that. And it gets to this whole philosophical question of what's the best way to take in a show like this. It was uh, Slate.com and uh, Grantland that had a little bit of a debate going this week here. Grantland seemed to be getting on what I would call a little bit of a hipster point. Is like, oh, hey, this is great. You want to be able to sit down, take it in a marathon. Oh, it's an exhilarating thing to consume it that way versus Slate going, hey, look, it was meant to be consumed episode by episode, week by week. you got to let it breathe. you got to be able to digest on the things. Having watched Breaking Bad both ways, and like I said, seasons one and two, I, I guess, you know, I did inhale them that way. From seasons three onward, I've watched them week by week, although with season four, as I indicated also, uh, I did give myself a 24-hour refresher course on that recently. I'm with Slate on this one, and certainly I'm rarely with them on anything political, but I'm with them on this as far as TV watching, and I get the sense you're probably much the same way. Yeah, but here's the catch-22, Rick. When you watch an episode of this, you absolutely want to know what comes next. You do not want to wait. But, you know, I mean, it's like, wow, there, what happened? Oh, great, next episode, please. Thank God I don't have to wait. But you miss a lot. And I told you twice while I watched these on DVD, I stopped. I either stopped the episode somewhere near the end and started it over and watched it again, or I would just rewatch the whole episode because it's there's so much in this show. There's so much going on. Is this, it's so well written. There's so many angles. You need to be able to consume it, and even if you're not going to jump online and read other people's reviews. And I'm sure that adds to it too, because in, I mean, that's a great way to do it: is watch it, read everybody's reviews, and then watch it again and be like, "Yeah, they're right. There, there it is. Oh, they're not right on that one. They're wrong." But you know, to be able to reflect, it's a show that you need time to reflect on it. I mean, I, I tried, as I told you before, I watched them, is to pause each, between each episode at least for like 10 minutes and think about what just happened. But that's the kind of show that you watch it on a Sunday night, you may still be thinking about it in your free time on Wednesday of the week, waiting for Sunday, the anticipation of what comes next and trying to figure out what's coming. And that's the way to watch this show. I mean, it's a show written for that. It's a show that does that better than any show I've ever seen. Like I said, 24 is the only thing that even comes close. But 24 had a lot of expected outcomes. This one doesn't have expected outcomes. That's what makes it so great. And, uh, you know, if, if you're going to go back, at least, you know, for the people that want to watch it all and maybe want to consume it, watch an episode, watch another one the next day, at least think about it for a day before you jump right to the next one because this show is much better if you space it out. But it's a tough balance because when you watch one, you absolutely want to have the next one. So and it's tough to do. Well, it's easy to make too much of this because the show airs on Sundays, but in some ways, the way that you're describing it there, and I agree with you, I mean, it, it's almost like uh, wait, waiting in football season for the NFL every week, isn't it? You wait for Sunday, like during the course of the week, I mean, some news comes out on injuries or whatever and, and things like that, or, you know, you hear at a press conference, oh, we saw this week, we looked at the film from last week, and we're going to maybe look at this for next week and how to prepare for this opponent. I mean, the thought process of preparing for a critically favorite show, favorite show on Sundays is almost sort of like looking forward to an NFL game every week. You know what, Rick, you just nailed it, because even though things like Major League Baseball, the NHL, and, and, and the NBA are popular, you never have that weight. You never have that the, the level of weight and detail and analysis and 
sure you want the next NFL game to be two days later, but to have to wait that extra week to watch your favorite team, you know, that's why I think football is the most popular sport. Maybe that's one of the reasons. People love football, both college and pro, because they have to wait. There's that anticipation. There's that buildup. You don't get that in any other sport. Maybe that's what the thought, you know, that's, that's, that's a great point, great analogy. And uh, yeah, that show is definitely like the NFL. And, you know, the NFL is the most popular sport. Uh, there's a reason for that. And uh, maybe that's something that, you know, that the show tapped into. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the the mention there. And, yeah, no, I, that was just something that kind of came to me as you were talking. Uh, I guess just to kind of bring it full circle, uh, something you and I were talking about off air, as much as I generally object to things happening that are, uh, I, I think too much of a contrivance on the part of the writers, i.e. things having been imagined, an entire season of Dallas, the entire series of Newhart supposedly just having been a dream. I feel like, okay, well, what did we invest ourselves in uh, as far as how this goes? And what was kind of funny was I guess it really screwed up Knott's Landing, the, the spinoff, because they were having to go off of the whole Bobby is dead thing, and from what I know, Knott's Landing never retracted on that part of it, which was kind of funny. But when I look at this, I said to you, as, as screwy as I know it sounds, I would not have a problem at all in the end if we find that, like, Walt went into a burning building to save somebody right after getting the cancer diagnosis, and this was all like a big dream, because this is a thrilling story to watch it unfold, but it's so profoundly disturbing on a human level, and, and they do such a great job of making it all seem real that... You, you just can't help but feel what a tragedy this is for his family, for Hank having gotten shot because of his actions, all the actions that stemmed from his initial decision to start cooking. On that part of it, I just feel like, you know, I, I'm rooting for the mulligan. I'm rooting for everybody to get a mulligan for Walt's bad actions. They probably won't go there. I think Walt Gilligan probably has way too much uh, integrity to go that route, but it's a measure of how disturbing a lot of this stuff is that I'm almost rooting for it on a moral level. Yeah, that's a great call. It's, it's, it's hard to see this character turn into what he's become. Uh, and maybe, you know, I agree. Maybe that, that, that'd be a, an acceptable out as well. I mean, like I said, like you said in this, during this conversation, they could have ended the season. I mean, they could have ended the series. It could be over. Some small unresolved questions. Maybe that's how they do need to wrap it up is to make him a good guy again. At the end, maybe there's some heroic act he could do, you know, jump in front of a bullet for Hank or something like that, which you, you get a sense of closure if he really was a good guy. Uh, that That is one of the questions I have. Will they let him end out in some way as a good guy, or do we get this, you know, a death of a psychopath at the end of the series? And, and there's no way to tell because these guys always keep you guessing. I think that's exactly uh, where it's going. And, Again, Season 5 is going to be the build-up for uh, what's going to happen in Season 6. Season 6, as I understand it, is going to be one eight-episode conclusion to the entire thing, basically, and an and eight-part one, uh, if you will, just kind of flowing seamlessly. So I, I don't have much in the way of thoughts, predictions, whatever. My, my guess is at the end of Season 5, we will see the table be set, maybe in terms of, of Hank really getting some strong suspicions, or, or possibly Jesse having been tipped to some bad things that Walt has done against him and, you know, some of his loved ones. Do you have any kind of a sense whatsoever about, uh, you know, end of Season 5 and moving into Season 6 as they wrap this thing next year? So let me ask you this. They're going to actually – we're going to have to wait a year for the last eight episodes. Is that the plan? We get eight weeks now. We, we are. They, they initially build it as a two-part two part, uh, season five, eight and eight. But I think now they've just dropped the pretense and said it's it's an eight-episode season both years. Because how stupid would that be, right? 5A and 5B, if they're separated by year, just call it five and six. Right. And you might as well charge 40 bucks for the eight-disc episode twice instead of just once, right? So <laughs> – well, I'll tell you but, what, uh, after having – Entourage did that once, and as somebody who's got all the Entourage discs, trust me, Nate, I had to pay separately for part one of, I think it was season three and part two, so they would have done that anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was coming. But, uh, probably. I don't – you know, that's the thing about the show, Rick. I don't know. I mean, obviously, they have to leave you with some lingering questions after these eight episodes, but I just – I don't even – I don't want to anticipate and be wrong, and that's the beauty of it. I've, I've kind of – you know, like I told you in the beginning of this conversation, I'm a guy that analytically analyzes my shows, and I, I kind of think what's coming next, and I try to predict it. I've given up on that for this show. I'm just going to watch it and enjoy it. I can't figure out what's coming next. Nobody knows what's coming next. These guys are too good. I'm beat. I finally got beat by show writers. 
Uh, and, and that's fine because it's just so good to sit back and, and let it go where it's going and, uh, you know, not try to figure it out. Because if you try to figure it out, you're probably going to be wrong against these guys. They're good. It is very enjoyable. And, again, for, for guys like me and you who love to be analytical on things like this, I mean, and that's, that you know, if you, if you go back to the earliest days of FantasyDraftHelp.com and then the FDH Lounge, it's about breaking things down, being intellectually curious on stuff. And TV shows like this that really allow guys like me and you to sink our teeth into this thing, you know, are, are, are just a perfect example for being able to go out there and do this kind of thing. So uh, a pleasure, as I knew it would be, and such great material for our listeners. Thank you so much, Nate, and I look forward to doing more of this kind of thing as we go along with various projects. Thank you, Rick, and maybe we do it again in a few months to wrap up this season. So, thank you. Uh, let's, let's, let's book it. I definitely want to do that. Uh, folks, uh, wait for that one there. End of uh, Season 5, we'll be back to do it again, and I know we'll be talking to Nate uh, before then. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Nate, for being a part of this one. Mini-episode number 152 of the FDH Lounge. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, the Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.